If you're one of those people who insists that Griffith did nothing wrong, then clearly this video is not for you. An argument can be made that Griffith is one of the absolute worst manga villains of all time, and a major contributing factor to this perception is the fact that for the most part, Miura's depiction of Griffith is borderline angelic. He looks like a god on earth, with his flowing silver locks and his effeminate face. Yet when you see him fight on the field or chalk out a winning strategy that absolutely no one can poke holes into, you realize just how dreadful he can be when he sets his mind to it. There were warning signs about Griffith not being the pristine white falcon that he was presented as from the get-go, and by the time the eclipse drew close, those signs turned into a sea of red flags. By the time this video ends, you will see that Griffith has always been a horrible, manipulative, possessive pretty boy, who thought he could get away with anything. And once you see that, his fall from grace will make much more sense. So, without further ado, this is every horrible thing Griffith has done in Berserk, explored. Before we get into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. Number 1. Making Casca perform womanly duties for Guts after their first encounter. They say that the first impression is the last impression, and we must not have been paying close attention when Griffith debuted in Berserk because, like we said earlier, the warning signs were already there. No, we're not talking about his appearance in the Black Swordsman arc, though we'll get to that later in this video. Griffith's first proper appearance in Berserk took place during the Golden Age arc, after Guts had defeated the mighty Grey Knight Bazuso. As he was making his way to the next battlefield, he was ambushed by Corcus and his group, whom Griffith failed to restrain from robbing another man blind. Red flag number one. Then when things started going left, he sent Casca to do the job he was supposed to be doing. When that failed, he joined the foray and managed to easily defeat Guts with a couple of swings and slashes from his saber. Griffith's ambition is such that he only focuses his energy on the things that he really needs to acquire for himself, opting to trust his underlings with taking care of the grunt work. The fact that he involved himself with Guts was a sign that he wanted him to enlist with the Band of the Falcon, and their first two encounters are certainly a testament to Griffith's own fighting prowess, but it was something he said in between those two fights that caught our eye more than anything else. When Griffith saved Casca and Corcus's crew from a rabid guts, he gave the latter a near-mortal injury. Griffith used his immense knowledge of the human anatomy and battle experience to stab guts just above his heart so as to keep him alive, but just barely. He then ordered his men to tend to guts, but he gave Casca a special duty, that of warming the swordsman's body. See, when you lose a lot of blood, your body starts going cold due to blood loss, and if it isn't taken care of externally, you might as well book yourself a plot six feet under the ground. So it does make sense why Griffith would have someone warm up the dying body of a soldier he really wanted on his side. What is alarming about it is who he chose for the job, and his rationale behind it. Griffith had Casca snuggle up to a man she barely knew for a couple of days, not because he wanted her to help his healing process, because, and we're quoting here, warming a man is a woman's duty. On the surface, it feels like an offhanded comment, a joke amongst mercenaries. But if you know that Griffith doesn't exactly have a sense of humor, then this becomes far more concerning. Keep the misogyny of that statement aside, just the fact that he thought it was a woman's duty to lie with a man should have been our first indication that this guy isn't as noble as he seems. But those massive flowing locks and that pretty face did a massive number on us in those golden age years. We started seeing more of Griffith's innate cruelty and propensity for horror once he began taking leaps towards achieving his dream. Number 2. Griffith's lack of remorse for the accidental assassination of Julius's son, Adonis. Politics and killings go hand in hand, and always have, but what made Griffith's assassination of General Julius so chilling was the complete lack of remorse he showed in its face, especially after learning that the plan had gone horribly wrong and taken an innocent life as well. Griffith commanding Guts to take out Julius isn't something we can criticize because, number one, Julius tried to have him killed first, so this was retaliation, and number two, Julius was probably the biggest obstacle to Griffith becoming king outside of his own son. Julius's son Adonis was the cousin of Midland's crown princess and was expected to be married to her when they both came of age. Being an obstacle in Griffith's path usually means a horrific fate for you, and that's exactly what Julius and Adonis got. But the thing is, both of them weren't supposed to die. 
Griffith only ordered the assassination of General Julius and even told Guts that he needed to be very careful with how he carried out this particular mission. Killing a man in the light of day and snuffing a man's life out in the black of night were two different ball games, and he specifically warned Guts to not be discovered. Guts, of course, ends up being discovered by Julius's son, whom he was forced to kill on his way out to cover his tracks. As soon as he realized just whom he'd killed, Guts was disgusted with himself. But Griffith? Griffith smiled the most evil smile we've seen from him in Berserk to date. Though he had told his man to only kill the general, the news of his son's passing didn't make Griffith recoil with remorse. It made him grin like a madman. To him, it was cherry atop a cake that didn't really need it, but would obviously taste better with it. He also never addresses the death of Adonis to Guts personally, despite the swordsman having sought him out in the aftermath of his blunder for that exact reason. You'd think that a guy who's been surrounded by young men his entire life, even leading 10-year-olds into battle, would show some compassion for a child that perished from his hand. But in that case, you would have entirely misjudged Griffith, because he isn't so much a magnanimous leader as a pragmatic opportunist. And what lays this fact bare is his encounter with a certain nobleman. Number 3. Griffith's Relationship with Lord Genon Money makes the world go round. This is an ideology that most of us living in the modern world are painfully aware of. We can't even consume water these days without paying up for it, and even back in the medieval era, money was a major concern, especially if you were one of those people wanting to start up a mercenary warband. When Griffith started the Band of the Falcon, he scrounged together men from all walks of life and forged them into a single unit with his own charisma and leadership skills. But charisma and causing chaos on the battlefield can only advance your ambitions so quickly when you dream of becoming the king of the world. In order to achieve his dream quicker and without suffering from massive casualties each time he led his men into battle, Griffith made what felt like a practical choice. At the time, he was employed by a two-door governor called Genon, whose salacious tastes were spoken of in hushed whispers all throughout his lands. The guy shared appetites with Vladimir Harkonnen from the Dune franchise, and when he saw the White Falcon, he was immediately smitten by him. Griffith was not a person who missed these slight changes changes in a person's body language. His mind was sharp enough to perceive a person's intent just by gazing into their eyes. He took advantage of Genon's attraction towards him and spent a night with him in exchange for a massive credit line that would keep the Band of the Falcon afloat. Again, practical decision, right? What makes it creepy is the fact that Griffith knew that Genon was using kids in his trysts and never seemed to quite want to rectify that mistake. Instead, all he saw was an opportunity to exploit an old man's lecherous attitude, and he even admitted to Casca later that him sleeping with Genon made him feel unclean, but he did it anyway. When he was reunited with Genon on the field of battle a few years after this incident, we learned that Griffith had probably lied to him too. Genon was under the impression that Griffith loved him, because Genon couldn't forget about the White Falcon and their night of passion, but for Griffith, it was purely transactional. He had no feelings whatsoever towards Genon, and he promptly stabbed the governor in his skull to prevent him from spreading dirty rumors about Griffith. Griffith was always only concerned about what he could get out of someone, and Genon was our first proper indication of that. If he'd been the White Knight of Berserk, he would have done something about Genon's captives at the very least. Instead, he put himself in a position similar to theirs just to exploit the man's lust. Number 4. Griffith's Lack of Accountability for the Lives Lost in His Service this was revealed in his mental breakdown in front of Casca following her discovery of Griffith's relations with Genon, and it gave us a very bleak insight into the outlook of a man overburdened by his own dreams. The previous night, Griffith had noticed Casca standing outside Genon's balcony, and as the nobleman led him inside, he gave her a look that screamed, I'm going to have to explain this very carefully to that girl there. The morning after Casca saw him with the governor, Griffith was taking a bath in a stream and invited her to join him when he saw her spying on him. But afterwards, he addressed her queries without her having to bring them up because he could feel Casca's judgment. Griffith knew what he did was morally disgusting. He knew that he had put himself in a position that could end up compromising his entire life. But he did it anyways. Not because his men were going to be safer for it, but because he was tired of losing human resources to the woes of war. In his breakdown, Griffith addresses all of Casca's concerns regarding him sleeping with Genon with cold, hard logic. He had to do what he did because more money means fewer lost lives and a faster path to success. But buried within that seemingly caring sentiment was a statement that should have made Casca feel terrified of being a falcon. And that was the fact that Griffith felt no accountability towards the men who died in his service. That ten-year-old kid we mentioned in the second entry died during a campaign under Genon's patronage. He'd only joined the band as a trainee six months prior, so Casca figured remembering his name would be an afterthought for mercs like her. But Griffith remembered. 
He knew the boy's name and his dream, having Pippin bring over the child's toy knight to bury him along with it. He recalled those times the boy would look at him as if he were some hero of a fantastical tale, but what he says next is what Casca ended up inflating with empathy and compassion from Griffith for his fallen comrade. Griffith wondered out loud whether the boy died enchanted by his dream or whether his dream died with him. Maybe it was Griffith's dream that took the life of that innocent child drawn to his service like a moth to light. Griffith was specifically worried about the child having died a death where he couldn't live out his most fantastical fantasies, because he himself was attempting to make his dream a reality. In the present, he flat out admitted to Casca that he felt zero responsibility for the men who died in his service, because in his mind, they chose to serve him. Griffith is fully aware of the fact that his dream is a blood-smeared dark fantasy which can only be built upon a foundation of corpses. He thinks his men know that as well, and that they choose to cling to his dream anyway. So in order to repay their deaths, the only thing he can do is win. Not because he wants to avenge them, but because it bothers him to remain unclean. Him sleeping with Genin, to his mind, was being accountable to his people. He sullied himself, so he could not hold himself above those who died for him. But he fails to understand the fundamental difference between those two things, and the fact that Casca didn't comprehend his words fully at this moment is what twists this breakdown into a semi-heroic admission of guilt, when in fact, Griffith explicitly rejects that guilt. His attitude towards his men would end up becoming even more callous in the years to come, but that's a point we'll address in a bit. For now, let's just explain to you the lengths to which Griffith was willing to go in order to realize his dream. Number 5. Griffith brutally stamped out his competition in a single night. There is nothing quite like an attempt at your life to put you on high alert and on the hunt for enemies in every shadow, but with Griffith, that was taken to the extreme. He was not content with simply killing Julius because he knew that the Midland Royal Court was a den of snakes. He was going to have to cleanse it of that venom and leave no opposition to his dream. To that end, he pulled off one of the most chilling power moves in all of Berserk. He killed the Queen of Midland. After returning from the Battle of Doldry, Griffith was about to be raised to the post of White Phoenix General and made a mainstay of Midland's regular army. He was very close to achieving his dream, but he wasn't naive enough to think that things wouldn't go off without a hitch. Griffith had anticipated another attempt on his life long ago, and he got his confirmation when he was confronted by the slimy Minister Foss. Griffith deduced that Foss was the main link to busting open this secret cabal opposing him. So what does he do? He does what any logical man would have done and has Foss's daughter kidnapped. He then blackmails Foss into being his accomplice to the arson to end all arsons. As Griffith sets all of his enemies alight in one go, he declares that on the battlefield, the threat of death was never far from your person, and he had just been the better fighter on this occasion. The malice in his words was very clear. Griffith was enjoying what was happening right now. When he let go of Foss's daughter, he told the statesman he hoped to have friendly relations with him in the future, as if he hadn't just torched all of his court friends alive. Griffith had the gall to ask Guts if he thought Griffith was cruel for doing all of this, but this time we have to lay the blame on Guts. He could have simply told Griffith he thought this was immoral. Guts was the one who had to bear the burden of killing Adonis. He had put his life on the line countless times for Griffith's dream. Later in the series, he would develop his own dream and realize the folly of his old days, but at this moment, he chose to reaffirm Griffith's faith in his dream. Guts told him that it was okay to do this because it ultimately meant Griffith was getting what he wanted, which is something Griffith had become very accustomed to. This would come back to bite him in the butt, as we all know, but let's not let that detract from just how cold-blooded Griffith's approach to all this was. He chose to brutally stamp out all opposition to his ascension instead of politically outmaneuvering them, and while it was a brilliant move, it also exposed the horrifying lengths to which Griffith was willing to go. Number 6. Griffith's Manipulation of Princess Charlotte This one is just downright disturbing to us. From the moment Griffith met Princess Charlotte, he knew he had to get in good with her, and so every interaction he's had with her should be taken with a massive pinch of salt. Griffith is very aware of his physical attractiveness and the effect that it has on people. He had already used it to his advantage with Governor Genin, but the difference with Charlotte was that she was, unlike Genin, number one, still in her teens, and number two, the key to him achieving his dream. From the very beginning, Griffith intended to manipulate and seduce Charlotte to ensure his ascension to the throne, and when you keep that in mind, what he does with her the night of Guts' departure becomes a much darker affair. 
We know Griffith is already unstable after losing his most valuable soldier, and he arrives at Charlotte's chambers all wide-eyed and vacant. After exchanging pleasantries for a few moments, he forces a kiss upon Charlotte, who vehemently rejects him at first. Griffith doesn't care though. He manipulates her into thinking she's just scared, when in truth, he's the one spiraling out of control. Griffith's seduction of Charlotte causes his downfall, because he didn't go to her for love. He went to her for power, and he retains power over her for the rest of the story following that encounter. Charlotte proved crucial to facilitating Griffith's escape from the Tower of Rebirth. She literally prayed day and night for his return so she could be safe from her incestuous father. So when he did come back, all he had to do was be who he is, and she was back in the game. Charlotte doesn't know a single thing about what Griffith did after escaping Wyndham. Where he was for the last two odd years, why did he come back now, and she's just fine with it. The Power Girl doesn't even know that the man she used to love and the man she's about to crown the King of Humanity are two different beings, quite literally. Charlotte is one of those characters who have blind faith in Griffith, and everything we've told you so far should let you know that that's the last thing you should be doing. Number 7. Griffith's opinion on what a true friend is shows his facetious nature. Another facet of his horrible personality reveals itself during a conversation with Charlotte, where he describes what a friend means to him. Since he was introduced to Berserk, Griffith was a quirky enigma who was made out to be an outstanding leader and friend by everyone who was in his band. But, turns out, Griffith didn't even think of them as humans. To him, they were just tools for acquiring his dream. In his conversation with Princess Charlotte outside Primrose Hall, Griffith explains that he thinks his band has excellent troops who are important to his life, but they're not his friends and certainly not worth losing sleep over. To Griffith, a true friend was someone who had a dream, like his own, and could stand on equal footing with him, which is a total lie because he clearly thought Guts was his friend. Griffith had risked his life for Guts and placed his explicit trust in Guts to help him with his worst plans because he thought Guts was his closest friend. His rejection of this fact in the service of keeping up a veneer of superiority tells you just how out of touch with his own truth the man was. Griffith didn't even see his comrades, some of whom he'd been riding with for years, as human beings worth befriending. They didn't even know this about him, and Guts only overheard it because he was present at Primrose Hall when Griffith uttered these words. Griffith is a man who lies to himself about his own feelings, and that doesn't just make him facetious, it also makes him dangerous to those around him. This becomes glaringly obvious when, for the first time in his life, something dares to leave his grasp. Number 8. Griffith's obsession with Guts made him blame the swordsman for all of his misfortunes. From the day he met Guts, Griffith was borderline obsessed with him, and he went out of his way to recruit Guts and placed more implicit trust in him than even Casca, who was his second in command. But this obsession only became a problem when, in Griffith's mind, Guts dared to think for himself. See, the day Griffith defeated Guts and added him to the Band of the Falcon, he didn't simply enlist the guy. Griffith told Guts that he owned him now. He treated Guts like his pet project and fawned over his achievements whilst covering up for his flaws with his own ingenious battle strategies. So when Guts told Griffith he wanted to leave the Band of the Falcon and pursue his own path in life, Griffith couldn't take it. That fight they had three years ago was more or less balanced because Griffith was still an active combatant back then. This time, it wasn't even a competition. Guts shattered Griffith's sword with one swing and went on his way without so much as looking back at him. This broke the White Falcon, who had just lost his greatest asset in his mind, and it forced him to sleep with Princess Charlotte. Griffith managed to evade accountability for his actions, to the point that when he was getting tortured, he started blaming Guts for his misfortune. We know that it was Griffith who chose to seduce Charlotte, who aggravated the situation with the king by calling out his lust for his own daughter. We know that Griffith was responsible for even Guts leaving the Band of the Falcon, though he wouldn't know it at the time. And yet, once his torture began, he could only hate Guts for it. When the Griffith rescue party arrived in Wyndham and the fallen Falcon saw the very person who had destroyed his dreams in his mind, his first reaction was to try and strangle Guts to death. 
and even after being rescued by the Hundred Man Slayer, Griffith managed to keep finding more reasons to hate Guts instead of reflecting on his own follies. The White Falcon had come off as a maverick leader with an ingenious brain in his introduction, but when he was broken down and defeated, we saw that that was all just the surface. Deep within the recesses of his mind lurked an evil sense of self-assuredness that allowed him to swiftly blame others for his own actions, which is why he probably didn't even think too much of it when he nearly did the worst possible thing he could to Casca. Number 9. Griffith tried to force himself on Casca after being exposed. Following the White Falcon's escape from Wyndham, the King of Midland was, let's say, driven to capture him again at the very least. He dedicated most of his fighting forces to hunting down the Band of the Falcon, and even unleashed the abhorrent Black Dog Knights onto them, who were led by the detestable Apostle Wilde. Guts and Co. managed to defeat Wilde in his released state somehow, but before he was sucked into the abyss, the Apostle ended up exposing Griffith's broken body to his comrades. He thoroughly shamed them, and by extension Griffith, for even thinking that they could reform under his leadership when he couldn't even swing a sword anymore. And this moment marked the beginning of the end for the White Falcon. After Wilde was actually defeated by Nosferatu Zod, Casca retreated to Griffith's wagon with him to redo his bandages, and he tried to force himself on her. Casca was shocked in the beginning, but then gave him a pity hug because of everything Griffith had done for her in the past, but that doesn't justify this act. When Griffith had saved Casca from being defiled by a rich nobleman, he told the guy off by asking him if having status and wealth meant he could do whatever he liked. Now, even though he was stripped of all status, wealth, position, and even chunks of his own flesh, Griffith did the same thing that nobleman did all those years ago. He had noticed the relationship that had developed between Guts and Casca, but he wasn't sure until this point. He did what he did once again, in a desperate attempt to take some control over his own life. Griffith is a vile, power-hungry miser who can't confront his own thoughts, so he tries to force himself onto others. And nowhere was this clearer than in his attempt to take Casca. But as disgusting as this moment was, it turned out to only be an appetizer for what was about to happen to the story overall. Number 10. Triggering the Eclipse Griffith's sanity had started slipping from him even when he was in the Tower of Rebirth, but it completely broke when he realized Guts and Casca had overheard his description of what a friend was. In that moment, his mind snapped, and he started chasing a hallucination of his childhood self that was telling him that playtime wasn't over yet. Griffith rode his wagon all the way to a lake west of Wyndham, where he hit a rock and fell into the water, breaking his arm in the process. Maddened by the pain and rage and grief and all the violent emotions swirling inside of him, Griffith tries to end his own life at the edge of a sharp wooden plank, but when even that fails, he finds his behelet and activates it, summoning the God Hand. Many people like to equate the opening of an interstice with the beginning of the eclipse, but that isn't exactly true. What triggers the eclipse is Griffith's decision to sacrifice his mercenary band. See, in Void's description of the eclipse, it is described as a sacred nocturnal feast for all demon kind, and for it to count as a sacrifice, the meals had to be branded with the brand of sacrifice. At first, Griffith was just as scared of the God Hand and the Apostles as the rest of his band was, but as the God Hand started working its manipulation on him and showing him his true self, Griffith came to accept that he was first and foremost a martyr to his dream. To achieve his dream, he was now willing to go to any lengths, including giving up people he had led and cultivated bonds with for years in an instant, just for a power boost. The nocturnal feast truly began when Griffith uttered the words, I sacrifice, and gave up the Band of the Falcon as offerings to demon kind. And, just to put the dot under this disgusting exclamation mark, Griffith didn't feel a thing while doing it. In Chapter 82, we see his astral body sink into the abyss, as his physical body is enveloped in a cocoon for his impending rebirth. He thinks to himself that he wished it. He killed his comrades, and yet strangely, he didn't feel a single thing. Even when their deaths pierced through his soul like so many arrows, he felt no remorse for having willed their demise for his own personal gain. The Eclipse is a crystallization of the person that Griffith truly was, for in this ceremony, his actual thoughts and feelings were laid bare. He only cared about achieving his own goal, and would suck in anything else trying to stop him from achieving it like a terrible maelstrom from here on out. This is why when he's reborn as the God Hand member Femto, his form looks pretty similar to his human self at the time of his ascension. But even that familiarity couldn't have prepared anyone for his first act as a demon. Number 11. Femto's First Act as a God Hand 
Up until this point, everything we've told you about Griffith is pretty opinionated in that these are our opinions on why we think he's the worst person ever. There are many in the Berserk community who take those same points and argue that Griffith was a great person, and no one quite understood his greatness or the burden of his dream. But both sides agree that this act is what cemented his status as an ultimate bad guy, because there truly was no reason behind Femto violating Casca other than it being a pure act of dominance. In his final moments as a man, Griffith lamented the fact that he had allowed Guts to take such a hold over himself that he gave up on his dream. So now, he was going to defile the very thing that Guts held dear to his own heart, and that was Casca. This was just an act of pure malice. There's no justifying it, and Miura sensei made it pretty clear that this was Griffith's power move on Guts, because Femto kept forcing him to watch the violation play out. Needless to say, if people on both sides can hate you for a single deed you committed, then it's more or less safe to assume you're a terrible person. Oh, we're sorry, terrible demon. But the crazy thing is, the violation of Casca wasn't even the worst thing that Femto could have done upon being birthed, because his birth itself was part of a foreboding prophecy from a thousand years ago. Number 12. Griffith was literally prophesied to bring about an Age of Darkness. The revelations say that when the sun dies five times, a red lake will appear to the west of the city with a name both new and old. It is proof that the fifth angel will alight. The angel is the falcon of darkness, the master of the sinful black sheep, the king of the blind white sheep, the one who shall call upon the world an Age of Darkness. These words are written in the scripture of the Holy See, and in a tragic twist of irony, they describe perfectly the sequence of events that has occurred thanks to Griffith's fall from grace. The eclipse where Femto was born is the fifth of its kind, and the God Hand are also thought to be the guardian angels of desire. After transforming into a near-divine entity, Femto incarnates into the physical world in a body of flesh and becomes the prophetic Falcon of Light, who is the leader of the sinful black sheep, aka the Apostles, and the blind white sheep, which would be the humans of Midland. The Age of Darkness he calls upon the world is most likely the great roar of the astral world, which merged the physical and astral planes and put the entire planet in a state of fantasia. With every human nightmare now coming to life within this world quite literally, all Griffith would have to do to keep himself above everyone else was pretend he was a good guy, and we already know how great he is at doing that. The sad irony in all of this is the fact that the Holy See thought Guts was the Falcon of Darkness, as they sent Farnese's Holy Iron Chain Knights to capture him. But when the actual Falcon of Darkness arrived on the scene, the sea bent over backwards to accommodate him. People don't know just how Griffith came back into the world, because if they did, they would immediately abandon him and find refuge somewhere else. If Farnese knew about the Eclipse, or even the fact that Griffith was in charge of both humans and apostles, she could have deduced the truth behind his disappearance from Wyndham and realized that he was the true Falcon of Darkness. Alas, this is Berserk, where people don't do things until they're too late, including our protagonist. Number 13. Your petty existence is beneath us. This was Griffith's actual introduction to Berserk, and it was about as cold-blooded an intro as you can expect from a manga. After the Slug Count activated his Behelet and summoned the God Hand, Guts immediately leapt at Femto for now obvious reasons, but was easily repelled by the Demon Angel's spatial powers. When Guts tried to defy causality and screamed Griffith's name out loud, Femto remarked that he was still squirming about in his pitiful existence. He treated Guts like a literal insect here, swatting him out of the sky twice and tanking both a cannon shot and a swing from Guts's Dragon Slayer. But the real horror happened when he became the one doing the convincing for the invocation of doom, because unlike Void, Griffith didn't dress it up with preacher-like words. He straight up told the Count that if he wanted to live, he'd have to sacrifice his daughter, and kept pressuring him to go through with it until the last possible moment. Turns out, this wasn't just a pressure tactic, because as we would find out later, had the Count gone through with giving up Teresia, the advent of Fantasia would have occurred much earlier. When Femto reaches Shiva's head in his released form and manipulates the spatial slash coming off of Skull Knight's sort of actuation to trigger the great roar, he mutters to himself that this was only possible because he had the body of a twice reincarnated apostle in front of him. It seems like Ganishka's descent into the man-made Behelet was a backup plan for the God Hand, because if the Count had given up Teresia here, then the world would have entered the Age of Darkness long before the Kushan arrived. Number 14. The Incarnation Ceremony 
Laying the blame for the incarnation ceremony solely on Femto's shoulders is a bit unfair considering every God Hand member had a part in actualizing it, but it still must be mentioned that the whole reason it even happened was for Griffith's sake. Hundreds if not thousands of people died and were consumed by the blood flow of the dead for Femto's incarnation into the physical world to become possible. The egg of the perfect world was given his shape and purpose for the specific task of incubating Femto's new body of flesh. Heck, the incarnation ceremony happened once in a thousand years, and if we take that along with the information that Femto is the prophesied Falcon of Darkness, then it feels as though the Conviction Arc was penned during Supreme King Geyseric's era. The amount of death and destruction that took place in St. Albion was horrific to say the very least. The 2016 anime adaptation does not do proper justice to the sheer horror of the blood flow of the dead, even though they try their best. That moment where Casca is surrounded by the malign blood blobs lives in our nightmares, and everything that follows in its wake just keeps getting worse. It took the blood and souls of every person gathered in St. Albion, dead or alive, to bring one God Hand member into the physical world. And when you weigh that against the wasteland that we see in the aftermath of the incarnation ceremony, you start to realize that this man was no savior of the world, even though the rest of humanity bought into the white lie. Number 15. Griffith manipulated humanity into thinking he is their savior. In Berserk, the concept of the subconscious plays a major role as it is the very thing that gives the astral plane life. On many occasions, dreams and portents and such have turned out to be accurate prophecies, and when the people of Midland collectively saw the Falcon of Light in their dreams, they thought it meant their salvation. The three Revelations chapters show a brilliant white falcon soaring through the dreams of every person in that grand old kingdom, and possibly the entire rest of the world as well. And when they saw it, they instinctively knew that the falcon's arrival would signify their salvation, and the one symbolizing it would be their savior. Of course, no one besides Guts, Cask, and Rickert knew that Griffith's permanent residence was now in literal hell, but the people of the world knew of Griffith as the undefeated White Falcon from the Hundred Year War, and so they instinctively attached this dream to him, and awaited his return with bated breath. The thing is, this entire prophecy is a bunch of bull. We've already established that Griffith is the prophesied Falcon of Darkness spoken of in the Holy See scriptures. So how can he be the Falcon of Light as well? Our answer? He isn't. Or at least, the Falcon of Light is a misrepresentation of his true purpose on Earth, and the dream itself is something that could be a side effect of the God Hand's powers. In Revelations 3, the White Falcon appears to Nosferatu Zod and tells him that it is speaking to him from the middle ground between consciousness and dreams. It then proceeds to strike off one of Zod's horns and reveals itself to Griffith when the Immortal One arrives in St. Albion. The God Hands are profound astral beings with untold powers, but when it comes to the incarnation ceremony, here's how we see it having played out. Conrad helped spread the plague, Slan helped spread the heresy, and Ubik was the one who sent out the Falcon of Light dream to the people of the world. It was either him or Femto, or maybe the both of them together, but the encounter with Zod makes it crystal clear that the Falcon of Light prophecy was manufactured by the God Hand. So when Femto finally does get incarnated in a body of flesh as Griffith and starts liberating Midland from the invading Kushan forces, no one questions him, and everyone is drawn to him as if they were two opposing magnetic poles. Without using a single word, Griffith managed to manipulate nearly all of the human beings on Earth that he was going to be their savior, and if that isn't diabolical, we don't know what is. Well, that end. Number 16. Griffith tricked humans into fighting alongside apostles. Yup, this happened. So if you know anything about apostles in Berserk, you'll know that humans are basically their bread and butter, and we do mean that literally. From the moment they were introduced to the story, apostles have been presented as predators, and that's a blanket term for many vile activities. But when Griffith was incarnated into the physical world, his natural presence as a god hand drew apostles from all over the globe to his presence, and they ended up becoming his war demons in the real born band of the falcon. Because the war demons were quite literally demons, Griffith was very careful about deploying them in their release state early on in his campaign against the Kushan. The only time he sent them in fully unleashed was when they executed a sneak attack on the demon city of Windham, and were forced to fight against Ganishka's Daka and Pishacha Ghana. 
It wasn't until the final battle between Ganeshka in his Shiva form and the Midland Liberation Army that the humans supporting Griffith realized their primary soldiers were literal monsters. In order to combat Ganeshka's massive Shiva spawns, Griffith had no choice but to send in his war demons in their apostle forms, but not one human in his army knew the truth behind apostlehood. Even Sonya, who is Griffith's biggest simp in the whole series, was taken aback by the terrifying scene unfolding in front of her as monsters fought against monsters. The people of Midland started questioning Griffith's allegiance to demons, and got so far as to questioning his own nature, but before they could follow this extremely pertinent line of inquiry, Sonya piked in and crushed those thoughts. She forged the Band of the Falcon into one will by encouraging the humans to fight alongside the demons who had bled for them for so long in this entire liberation campaign. And somehow, this insane gambit pays off. Humans comfortably fight alongside apostles, even coordinating battle sequences with them, which is something unprecedented. Of course, as a God Hand member, Griffith can perceive the flow of causality, and so there is every chance in the world that he knew about Sonya's intervention beforehand, but it still doesn't change things. Griffith has put the humans in his service in a very precarious position, because he knows damn well that he is the only thing keeping them from devouring his prospective subjects. And this becomes even more terrifying when you realize that he's letting their hunger for human flesh stew, instead of trying to reasonably address it. Number 17. Establishing Pandemonium after defeating Ganeshka and causing the advent of Fantasia, Griffith pointed his people towards their new paradise on Earth, his capital city of Falconia. On the outside, the Falcon City was a utopia in many ways. It had near-perfect construction, management, bureaucracy, housing, Heck, people actually trusted each other and cooperated with each other in this city unironically, which is saying a lot considering the circumstances under which Berserk plays out. But behind the grand city and its humongous royal castle lies its darkest secret, and quite possibly the seed of an inevitable calamity. When Rickard arrives in Falconia after surviving a harsh ride in a cockatrice encounter, he is granted an audience with Griffith. But before that, he's whisked away by Sir Locus the Moonlight Knight, who wanted this former falcon to see his leader's new beacon talons. Enter Pandemonium, a dome-shaped coliseum where the apostles engaged in constant death matches against the monsters of Fantasia. Turns out, Griffith wasn't simply eliminating the fantastical creatures that had overrun his new land. He was also rounding up some of them for his war demon's entertainment. The sole purpose of Pandemonium is to satiate the bloodlust of Griffith's apostles. We know this to be true because Rickert bears witness to a fight between an ogre and the apostle Borkov, with the latter savagely defeating and devouring his opponent in front of the former Falcon's eyes. Locus asserts that the fact that Griffith had managed to not only consolidate the apostles with humans, but actually give them a space to be themselves in, is proof that Falconia is an inclusive utopia. But if we've learned anything after reading nearly 400 chapters of Berserk, it's that these demonic beings prioritize their innate desires above everything else, and their ultimate desire happens to be walking the streets of Falconia as carefree as can be. On at least two occasions, Griffith's lesser war demons have expressed their desire for human flesh, reminiscing about its taste and nearly devouring Sonya and Guts respectively. Though his presence as a god hand keeps his war demons in check, his recent excursion to Skellig Island is proof that he won't exactly be around all the time to keep them in line. Many in the fandom have speculated that the true purpose for Falconia's creation is some kind of massive demonic sacrificial ritual, which we will see play out in the final arc of Berserk. And if that is the case, then his single most horrific creation is Pandemonium. He has kept so many apostles lacking the self-control of a Locus or a Zod in there that it's practically a ticking time bomb. And when the countdown on said time bomb hits zero, Falconians will realize that what they thought was a heavenly dream is actually a hellish nightmare. Number 18. Griffith indirectly ordered Rickert's assassination. The reason we say indirectly is because we never actually see who gave the order for Rickert's assassination. But make no mistake, the reason behind it was the pimp slap of the century. In chapter 337, Griffith was reunited with Rickard for a second time after their first reunion on the Hill of Swords. Back then, the young former Falcon was ignorant of the events of the Eclipse, and so he failed to understand Guts's rage towards Griffith. He also didn't get why Griffith's parting message back then claimed he might come to hate his former leader when he learned the truth 
but when Guts finally filled him in on the details of the eclipse, his confusion only intensified. It was only when he was faced by Griffith once again after learning the truth of what happened that Rickard made the choice to hate Griffith, and open palm smacked him across his smug face. Rickard rejected Griffith, but more than that, he was able to make aggravated contact with the God Hand member, something no one had done until then, or has done ever since. This pissed off the observing Locust so much that he crushed a balcony ledge with his fist, and this is where the identity of the man who ordered the hit becomes murky. It's very possible that Griffith, realizing the gravity of letting people see him get slapped, decided to stop it before it could happen again. But we must also consider the fact that Locust literally worships Griffith, and has a standing high enough in the Band of the Falcon to order such an assassination. Either way, Rickert was marked for death because of what he did to Griffith, and we seriously don't see the Falcon of Light having a problem with one less person in the world that knows his secret. Number 19. Destroying Flora's Mansion and Elfhelm We've grouped these two together because one was a preview for the other, and both of them spell disaster for the world at large. Following his incarnation into the physical world, the first thing that Femto did was revisit the Hill of Swords to confirm he'd shed his human emotions. The second thing he did was launch the Liberation Campaign of Midland. The third, and perhaps militarily the most important thing he did, was dispatch his war demons to take care of Flora the Witch. As a profound astral being residing in a body of flesh, Femto knew the danger that a well-trained and powerful mage could pose to his conquest. Not to mention the fact that anyone familiar with the astral world and its inner workings could easily expose his true status as the Falcon of Darkness. Flora is a witch who has lived well over a thousand years, and Elfhelm is a land populated by powerful witches and wizards. People on the latter location are even aware of Griffith's incarnation and his status as a god hand and Flora's spirit tree was getting in the way of the great roar of the astral world. Griffith wiped out both with utter ruthlessness. He sent his strongest war demons to Flora's spirit tree, and had Grunbeld set it aflame so it lost its footing in the physical world. Then, once he created the world spiral tree and spent some time getting his forces in order, he personally went to Elfhelm, and used his powers as a god hand to destroy the island. Griffith even managed to replicate the blood flow of the dead on Elfhelm and we've already explained how lethal that can be. With the Flower Storm Monarch and most other positive astral beings gone from the physical world, there is little to no magical opposition left for Griffith. And just to round out this great cover-up and bring it home, he also stole the one thing that made him susceptible to death from Elfhelm. Number 20. Kidnapping Casca and Bringing Her to Falconia since his incarnation into the physical world, there are only two things that can cause Griffith to lose his composure or control over his own self. Number one, people outside his story, like Rickert, who managed to slap him despite being a puny human, and number two, the residual feelings of the demon child infused into his vessel. When the Moonlight Boy made his debut in the Berserk manga, we were wondering just why he was so possessive of Casca. That question was answered in chapter 364, where she realized that this boy and her demon child were one and the same, and we realized that the Moonlight Boy was basically Casca and Guts' baby taking over Griffith's body every full moon to go visit his parents. Rickard slapping him is something that Griffith can take care of without even needing to involve himself directly, as we've already mentioned a couple entries ago. What really opens him up to mortal danger is his transformation into the Moonlight Boy, because presumably, in this form, he can actually be killed. So what do you do to negate this weakness? You kidnap the boy's mother, of course, who is his primary source of affection. It's just downright disturbing that the mother also happens to be the same woman Griffith violated in his first act as a demonic God Hand member. So much is wrong with the fact that Griffith kidnapped Casca from Elfhelm, not the least of which is the fact that he once again made Guts helpless at the sight of him taking his lover away. But this time, we mean it quite literally. Casca fell unconscious as soon as she saw the Falcon of Light. Memories of the Eclipse and every other horrific thing that had happened to her flooded into her mind, and she passed out with her brand of sacrifice bleeding profusely. Griffith didn't even have to fight her to take her away with him. He simply walked over, picked her up, wrecked Elfhelm, and left with Zod. He then returned to Falconia with Casca in tow, which is a can of worms we can't wait to open up when we get to chapter 372 later in April. The logic behind Griffith's abduction of Casca is sound from a battle standpoint, 
But take into consideration the fact that she had just spent over two years literally mindless because of this man. And the moment she became sane again, he probably shattered her mind once more just by showing up in front of her. Upon his return with Zod, Sonya is shocked to see Griffith carrying another woman in his arms. But the expression that is truly seared into our minds is the one of Griffith, smirking, knowing what he had just accomplished with one fell swoop. He'd eliminated his greatest obstacles, incapacitated his arch enemy, and stolen the key to killing him as far as we're concerned. And as grim and macabre as it might be, we can't wait to see where Kujimori and Code decide to pick up the story from in a couple of weeks, because we have a nagging suspicion it will be in Falconia. And if that is the case, then ooh boy are we in for a ride. Marvelous Verdict, and that's our list. Many entries on this video aren't horrific acts, they're more philosophical treatises on the moral choice, and we think that's what makes Griffith such a spine-chilling villain. All of us can relate to his motivations to some degree or another, and all of us can understand his actions to a certain extent as well. While none of us will spend our time justifying the many terrible deeds this man has committed in his life, the way we connect with his character as readers is something that's best left unspoken. Because we don't want a bunch of fallen falcons dive-bombing our society with their intense sense of longing, now do we? Let us know what you think is the worst thing Griffith has ever done in the comments section down below. And remember to like and share this video, and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching, stay safe out there, and have a marvelous day.